Which game do you think is your best right now and why? I think it might be Potlum in Omaha. Really? I really enjoy it. I think it's a great game. I really uh, wanted to play the 1500 today, but mm -hmm. uh, obviously I was, at, I, was at, I was at the final table. <laughs> I was at the final table, so. But yeah, Potlum in Omaha. Um, what is it about Potlum in Omaha that intrigues you? And it's just. It, it's such a different game, you know. It, like it's a, it's not a limit game, and all the limit games are basically about, you know, playing cards and everything. Very mathematical. It's, it's, it's so much like the jump between limit hold'em and no to limit no limit hold'em. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the jump from no limit hold'em to pot limit Omaha. It just really? completely changes. Your cards almost don't matter at all, except in like, just a few situations. And it's about playing the player and you know making good laydowns and good reads and everything, and. Um, it's just it's such an aggressive game, but at the same time, I don't think it's ever going to really take off as Nolan Holden did because, like, if you have one person who's really bad at pot limit, pot limit Omaha and mm -hmm. they've decided they're going to play like five five at a casino with like twenty thousand, mm -hmm. and Nolan Holden blowing through twenty thousand playing five five would take years if yes, played I mean, live. Yes, that would take some time. In Omaha, it could happen in a in a week. Is that e swing easily? Not it's, it's not even just swing. You can get your money in so bad, um, so so many times. You can get your money in twice in orbit, drawing stone dead. Like, if you have like a no limit hold'em mentality. Okay. So, like the players who just don't understand the game are going to, you know, lose a quick twenty thousand. What types of mistake would they make? Do they make? Not fo not folding aces basically ever. Like they they see aces and they think oh no limit hold'em aces. Mm -hmm. Like if you. Our no limit hold'em player playing like somewhat deep stack and you never fold aces. It's it's a mistake, but it's not that big of a mistake. All right. In Potlum in Omaha, you need to be able to throw away aces pre flop in certain situations. You need to be able to um, know that on the flop, basically, if the flop comes bad enough against two people, you need to just check and fold your aces immediately. Okay. Um, it's such a game about board texture, just knowing, like... What would you say is a bad flop if you have two aces? Well, what kind of flop would you get away from? You know, if the flop comes 10, 10, 9, 8, like, all su suited, all or suited. Like, not even that, just, like, I've check-folded aces on, like, a, you know, king, king-jack-nine board. Mm -hmm. Just, like, check-fold, because you know that your opponents, like, if they don't have you crushed... They they're drawing. Yeah, they're, they're probably a favorite over you, because Omaha, you know, everyone says it's such a drawing game. But at the same time, um, you have to make sure that you have a good draw, too. And when people put you on aces, mm -hmm. that goes out the window. They immediately just, like, put you on aces and will get, get in with any pair and any three live cards, and they're a big favorite over you. Especially if they know that you're not going to be able to get off the hand. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, if, if you're in there flipping coins for, like, thousands of dollars and you're not ready to have a bankroll to sustain that, mm -hmm. then you'll go broke incredibly quickly. Well, let's talk about the tournament you just final tabled. We talked about the $2,000 buy in Omaha 8 or better. How did that event go for you, like from the beginning? How did you make it there with pretty short stack the entire way, no? Uh, at one point during the first day, I had a very large stack. Okay. And at one point during the second day, well, it, it was actually weird. Both days, the first level, I lost half of my chips, like almost immediately. So I had 2,000 early on day one. Would you say that's through one. fault of your own or just through getting cold decked? Um, I may have made a few mistakes uh, trying to force things, mm -hmm. but at the same time, uh, you know, Omaha 8 is a game where it's not really whether or not you see a showdown. It's just a matter of where the money gets in, basically. Okay. You can make some good folds, don't get me wrong, and a lot of the good folds come pre-flop. But at the same time, like, it's basically about getting value from your hands and not losing a lot when it's your second best hands rather than getting away from hands. Okay. Because it's a limit game, uh, you can flop so many hands and so many possibilities, you're getting huge odds on every street. So I was down to 2,000 in the first level and built it back up to 10,000 in like less than an hour. It was, wow. I scooped like five <laughs> or six really big pots in a row. I ended the day with about 20,000. Um, and then day two, I lost half my chips in the first level. <laughs> And then got it up to forty thousand in the next hour, scooping a ton of big pots. Um, I wish that had happened in day two. <laughs> uh, I started today really short, thirty-three thousand, with the stakes going up to six and twelve thousand. So mm -hmm. not very many chips. I got it all the way up to about one thirty or one forty, mm -hmm. and then I just could couldn't pull a chip out of a pot basically. And you know, uh, it's gonna happen. That game is a very swingy game in a tournament, and uh, the people who run really good and scoop lots of pots are gonna have a lot of chips.
Yeah. So what did you think of the caliber of players at the final two tables? Do you think it reflected what it should have been at that point in the tournament? I think there were some very good aggressive young players who were probably a bit experienced in the game. And mm -hmm. I think there were a few older players who um, have a few big leaks in their game, uh, especially in a tournament. What kind it, of leaks did they have? They cannot get value from their big hands. or They're too, they're too scared to put in that last bet on the river for value. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of people can't checking behind with like, height. yeah, exactly. Like people with aces, like dry aces, all the lows have missed, all the draws have missed. The guy's probably going to call you with top pair or even worse. You know, mm -hmm. I've gotten called with middle pair, no low, no, you know, nothing uh, several times. Mm -hmm. And when they check three times against you, your aces are good. You have to get that extra bet in there. The average stack downstairs is something like 10 bets or something. So mm -hmm. one big bet is a lot of chips. And I understand that it sucks when you bet and get called, yeah. but that's what hand reading skills are for. I mean, you have to know that your hand is good, and you have to know that the guy can pay you off with worse. And that's a lot. That's a big part of the mistakes that I see people making in limit games. So, how do you think your hand reading abilities have improved since you've begun to play more live? Um, I think it has. I or think people reading abilities maybe would be more accurate. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know. I, I don't like using live tells on just to make a decision. Like, I'm, I'm never going to use a live tell to go against what I feel my hand reading thinks their hand is. Basically, yeah. I, I said that poorly. Like, if if my hand reading tells them they have the nuts, I'm not going to say, "Oh, look, they look nervous." Look at a live tell and say, you know, "Oh, I think he's bluffing now." Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if my hand reading skills a little murky, like he has a, either has the nuts or nothing, but man, he looks nervous. Um, you know, like he's he's doing weird stuff. Like I may look him up, but I'm definitely not going to let the whole thing hinge on a live tell. Um, I mean, and as you play more live, it'll probably progress, and you'll start to t trust your live tells more. Yeah, definitely. But at the same time, you know, I feel like a lot of live tells where people end up making a great call or a great fold, they're probably at the same time part of it is just luck. Because there's definitely you, truth to that. If you flip a coin, it's going to be right, you know, some of the time. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like you can't let it all hinge on that, but it's definitely not something you can ignore, and you definitely have to try to cover up your own live tells. You have to figure out what you're doing. Do you think you do that well? I like to think I do, but as you know, it's not like I'm consciously doing any of it anyway. So if I am doing something. You know, I'm not aware of it. Thank you very much for coming up to talk to me, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. Good luck for the rest of the series. Thank you. Lizzie Harrison with Jimmy Fricky for Card Player TV.